In this video, we'll be taking a look at my Sun Spark Server 5. This is basically the same as the Spark Station 5 workstation, which is a bit more common. The only difference is the Spark Server variant was sold, well, as a server, so it didn't include a frame buffer card, so a video card, or a floppy drive or CD-ROM drive. This one, however, as we'll see when we get inside, has been upgraded with a frame buffer card, so we can get video output and use it essentially as a workstation. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the outside of the machine, we'll take it apart and see how it's made inside, and then finally we'll fire it up and see it running. So the front of the machine has basically nothing on it. You've got the Sun logo here, the Spark Server 5 branding over here, and then these two sort of bits of plastic. This one has a speaker behind it, hence the holes drilled in it, and this one has a power LED hidden above it. So now we'll take a look around the rest of the machine. So on this side, there's just ventilation. This is where the air comes out of the machine. The air flows through it sideways and comes out here. On the other side, there's more ventilation. This is the air intake. And then here's just a pair of blanking plates where the floppy drive and CD-ROM drive would be if this had come with them. Now finally on the back of the machine we can take a look at what ports we get. So now here we are on the back of the machine. So here's the power supply which has standard IEC power input and then an output to the monitor. And then a power switch which is a sort of rocker switch that spring, springs from each position. So pressing down will switch it off and pressing the top part will switch it on. Over here we then have the locking mechanism. So this allows you to actually screw the machine, like chain the machine to a desk and, se and seal the machine shut. So what you can do is you can put a padlock through this and that will lock it in place. And there's a screw behind that that's required to take the lid off so if there's a padlock in place you won't be able to get to that screw. Now over here we have the rest of the ports. So we have a SCSI port for an external optical drive or hard drive. These are actually they're micro D sub ports but the top one's actually parallel and the bottom one is for an AUI Ethernet attachment interface. So that's a bit interesting because obviously the machine, just due to the size, they have to use these smaller ports, so you need adapters to use these. Then there's standard twisty pair Ethernet, a serial port, there's actually a pair of them, serial A and serial B. Then up here we have a 13W3 connector for the monitor, which unlike on the next station, does just output the normal sync signals that VGA requires, so a simple a cheap adapter such as this that will convert that 13W3 connection to a regular VGA port so you can use a normal monitor with it. Then finally over here on this side here, you see we have the connection for the keyboard and mouse which goes through on a sort of bus, so the mouse connects to the keyboard and then the keyboard connects into here and then finally some audio ports. So this actually does have built-in sound. There's then these sort of blanks here where you can actually put additional cards in. We'll take a look at that when we get inside. So now let's take the top off this machine and see what we have inside. So there's various screws on the back but the ones to take the lid off are actually labelled to little arrows here and here. So we can do that fairly easily so that just Take the one out here, this is the one that actually has a lock on it. There we go. So you see there's the little locking mechanism with the padlock hole. And then finally this screw here. Which you'll see is actually a spring-loaded captive screw, so that'll stay in the machine. So now to take the lid off, all you do is just carefully lift it up and remove it from the machine. The one problem with this is the lid actually has these sort of plastic clips on it here. And it's actually meant to have three of these, but two of them have broken off because just as plastic gets old it gets brittle. So I've still got one of these, so I need to work out a way to glue it back on because super glue just doesn't hold it. So if you do have one of these, be very careful because these little clips are quite fragile when you're taking the front of the machine off. So there's the inside of the lid, it's quite beefy, well really beefy, it's really solid. I think that yeah, it's actually got metal. Under, like, under this sort of thin foil there's actually a much thicker piece of metal so it's quite sturdy. So that's the lid. And now that's off, let's take a look at what we have inside. So around the front of the machine, here we can see the speaker and the power LED that I mentioned before. Both sort of hidden behind the front panel normally. So now here we are inside the drive bay of the machine. So over here is where the optical drive and floppy drive would be. So the floppy drive would go down the bottom and then the optical drive would go up the top. However you do need a special sort of half height optical drive which is very hard to get. However, you can just use a standard SCSI drive, you just won't be able to fit it in the case. There's the cable to connect the SCSI CD-ROM drive up, and there is the Molex power connector. With these machines, you do need to be quite careful with the SCSI settings on the optical drive to make sure it's set to the right um, SCSI ID and things like that. But once you've done that, you can just use a standard drive to boot. So now here we're looking at the hard drive bay. So we have this 2.1 gig Seagate hard drive, which is mounted in here, it's a SCSI drive. And there's space for two hard drives. There's another SCA connector above for a second hard drive to be fitted in. 
When I got this machine, however, it didn't have either hard drive or the caddy here. Instead, the previous owner had just attached a SCSI hard drive to this cable here. And it was just literally flapping around in the CD-ROM drive bay. So I had to buy the caddy and import that from Russia so I could actually attach the hard drive properly. So here's the caddy, it's just this clear plastic thing. And to remove the drive, you press this button in and it lifts up. Now you'll see when I lift it up, the drive will then slide away from the back plane and disconnect itself. So it's going to move now. So that's the hard drive now disengaged from the connector. And to remove it from the machine, you can just lift it up like that. So you can see this inside, there's the side of the drive with the little locking mechanism, like that there. And the drive is just screwed in using four screws on the bottom of it there. So that's the hard drive. And there you can see the second SCA connector that this was connected to. So here we can see the CPU in this machine. This is a 70 MHz Sun MicroSpark 2. It was also available with 85 and 110 MHz MicroSparks. So this is the lowest end CPU this machine was available with. You could also get it with a 170 MHz TurboSpark, which is like the top end option. So it's just a CPU, just in a simple socket, it's not got any sort of locking mechanism, it's literally just held in by the pressure of the pins. And there's the heatsink on top, which is weird, it's like three, is it three? Yeah, like three just discs stacked on top of each other. It's a weird sort of design. Probably doesn't require much cooling of this chip, it's not that power hungry. Here's the power connection to the motherboard, which is obviously a completely proprietary layout. And then behind here is the SCSI connector that goes out to the drives. Then behind this, you can see that, which is just the standard floppy connector for the floppy drive. Also interesting to note is there's actually a card edge connector on this PCB, eh, on the motherboard, here and on the other side next to the RAM. So I don't know what that would be used for. Now looking over here, we can see we have the RAM. So there's 8 RAM slots eh, in total, so this can give it up to 256 megs of RAM if they're fully populated with 32 meg sticks. Currently I only have 2 32 meg sticks, so this machine has a total of 64 megs of RAM. And take the stick out here. It's a sort of standard, it's a sort of proprietary Sun stick, so it's not standard PC RAM or anything. You see that's it there. There's a part number on the, on the other side of it. It's made by Mitsubishi. And you can see it's got these additional chips here, and that's because this is error correcting code, ECC memory. Because obviously this is a sort of workstation -y server type thing. So now here we can see the expansion slots this machine has. So it has three S bus slots, one here, one used by the frame buffer, and a third here. These are st standard slots used on various Sun machines. However, unique to the Spark Station 5, it also has this additional AFX slot, which is available for certain f a special frame buffer card that's just much better than the one that's used here. But they weren't really used in any other Sun machines. It's, all, it's got way more connectors though, so it's, all, and so it's obviously designed for like, obviously a very fancy card compared to the basic S-Bus ones. So here we have the, the, the frame buffer card that's in this machine. So we can take that out, there's just these little plastic clips here that flip down over the back to release it. They don't really work very well. And then you can just lift up the card by using this little handle at the back, which releases it from the slot, and then it unhooks like that. So there's our frame buffer card. So it's a standard sort of frame buffer card from the age of the sort of, the sort of BT RAM DAX and stuff. And there's the 13W3 connector we're looking at on the back. On the bottom of the card there's not really much, and then you can see there's the connector for the S-Bus. So now, now taking the frame buffer out, we can see a bit more of the motherboard. So over here we can see this cable which connects the power LED and the speaker. Here's the sound adapter, so this is the crystal sound chipset, so that's the sound card essentially. And then here we have the good old Sun NVRAM chip with built-in battery. On this machine again, it's like the, like the Ultra 5 I looked at before, the battery in this chip is dead, which is a complete pain. Um, and we'll see when we turn it on the problem that causes. Um, it is possible to change the battery in these, but you have to basically saw part of the chip off to fit battery, which isn't that easy. So that's what you see under the machine, under the frame buffer card. And then finally over here we can see the power supply, which is just fairly typical. It's very typical for the time in the sense that it has most of the current available on the 5 volt rail, which is a big contrast to current power supplies where everything's, everything's 12 volt generally. So yeah, that's power supply there. So now we'll put this machine back together and take a look at it running. So I've now hooked the machine up to a monitor using that adapter I showed earlier along with a Sun Type 5 keyboard and a regular Sun mouse. So I'm going to turn it on and see it running. So you can use the switch on the back to turn it on, however you can also use the button on the keyboard. So you press that, you'll hear it beep, and the machine will start to boot up. It's a very loud old hard drive you can hear there. So you can now see the machine is running. However, we're getting the, getting the dreaded message saying the ID prom contents are invalid. This is what I was talking about earlier with the battery being dead. So it's now just continues going to try and boot from the network. 
um, rather than seeing its hard drive because it doesn't understand that, it's forgotten its MAC address and it's just really quite unhappy right now. But you can see there, it says a Spark Station 5, so you actually see that even though this is branded as a Spark server, even the firmware still says Spark Station. Um, you can see it's got the 64 megs of RAM and yeah, it's just doing this. So what I now have is a huge list of commands that I need to run on a post-it note. So I need to run all these commands and that will allow me to set the MAC address correctly. So once I've done that, we'll be able to boot the machine. So we'll just do that now. So we're going to have to press stop A, which will drop us the OK prompt, and now I can enter these commands to set the MAC address. So those commands now set the MAC address in memory, and now what we need to do is run a command which will change the checksum that's in the ID prompt, so to make it valid so it will, it will successfully pass the check to check the validity of it. So now we do this to set the checksum. There, so that should have now set the checksum. So now hopefully if we reboot the machine, or reset, is it? Yep, the machine will now reboot. So hopefully this time, it will boot up and try and boot from the hard drive. So now here we can see the machine has booted up again, and now it's not complaining about the ID prompt contents being invalid anymore. And we can see the MAC address is now set to what I set from the notes I had. So you can see there we go. So now you can see it's still trying to boot from the network because that must just be the default boot device. You could set a flag to change that. So we'll just tell it to boot from the hard drive. So we're going to press stop A on the keyboard and then type in boot disk. And that will now tell it to boot from the hard drive. So you can see here we're running SunOS 4.1.4. This machine was right on the sort of period where they're transitioning between SunOS and Solaris. So I thought I'd chuck SunOS on it just because it's the oldest Sun machine I have currently, and I may as well try something different. I've already got Solaris on other machines. So you can see that's it booting up. So we're now at a login prompt. So if I were to log in as root here, I would go to a shell prompt. Or if I log in as a standard user, it'll take me in and it'll say it's starting open windows and you can press Control c to stop that and drop to the shell. However, it'll now go into the open windows gra graphical environment. Which I will warn you, I still have no idea how it works, but here it is. I can't really do much with it because it's a bit confusing, but we can see it running. So it's beeped and now there's the graphical environment loading. So here we have the graphical environment loaded, and over here we can see there's a help program, so you can actually see it, you get help with the system, and there's, you can just flip through pages in that. Up here we've obviously got a standard shell using CSH, and then here's a file browser, so you can browse through the machine and navigate that. If you right-click anywhere on desktop, you get this menu pop-up, where you can open sort of various programs through here, so there's a calculator, for example which interestingly opens a shell and then opens the calculator, but yeah, that, it's got things like that. Various tools on here. Audio tool. So you can record audio, obviously there's no microphone connected, but that's quite cool. So it's got, it's got various different programs that are built into the operating system. Um, I don't really know how many of these work, to be honest, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on them. There's a CPU meter. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So yeah, so that's the operating system. I don't know too much about it, so I can't go into too much detail now. Although if I work something out and use it a little bit more and get more used to using it, I might be able to do another video showing the operating system in a bit more detail. So now I'm trying to figure out how to shut this down. So you point it to exit. Please confirm to exit. There we go. And that's me now logging me out. And if I just do control C, it'll drop me to a prompt and I can probably just power off from here. Nope. Ah. Backspace doesn't work, it's really annoying. Okay, so I need to go in his roots, so if I log out there. And log in his root. With password or password, and then we can now shut down. Got to be excited there with it beeping. <laughs> and there, you can now see it shutting down. So we now drop to the OK prompt, and we can now turn the machine off which is power hyphen off. And that's machine now powered down.
So that was a look at my son Spark Server 5, or Spark Station 5 essentially. So yeah, there it was. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment, rate and subscribe. You can also visit my website at camgray.me and follow me on Twitter at camgray1515 and stand by for more videos like this in the future. So thanks for watching.